Um, a very good afternoon. I welcome you. So we all know why we are gathered here today. We are here to listen to one of the most uh, erudite and original voices in contemporary academia. It requires no introduction. Professor Kaviraj requires no introduction, but I'll still gather, display the temerity of saying a few words about him, of introducing him to you. He currently teaches at the University of Columbia. Um, he formerly taught at, the, uh, at Jawaharlal Nehru University, where he also earned his PhD. He works on Indian politics, political economy, intellectual and cultural history. He has uh, authored uh, numerous articles and uh, books he has also edited a number of books, um, the most well-known of, well of which are probably, the most well-known books authored by him are probably The Imaginary Institution of India and uh, The Invention of Private Life. The latter is already counted as a classic. I won't detain you further. I know that you are here to listen to Professor Kaviraj and not me speak, so I hand over the lectern to Professor Kaviraj. Over to you, sir. Okay, good. So what I'm going to present to you today would be uh, a kind of shortened version of something that I have started thinking about. Um, part of it I've thought about for a long time. Uh, part of it is new. What I'll present would be, you know, an argument in two parts. <coughs> The first part would be a very general argument about colonialism and intellectual history, or rather the intellectual effects of colonialism. Um, then I would turn to a discussion of what I have called to provoke you into a discussion, um, the non-nation state. <coughs> so it's a, on the one side it's a large argument, on another it's also a more intricate argument about the nation state. So uh, I've called it uh, the transversal movement in political theory. So I'll start with what is a transversal movement? <coughs> I think people who do political theory would recognize that modern political theory is a language which originated in the history of the West what we call political theory today, I think essentially a sustained uh, self-reflection of Western modernity about what was going on in <coughs> the transformation towards modernity in the West. But in a certain sense, that language of modern Western political theory has become generalized across the world. Up to this, I think it's very easy to understand but this generalization, what we call generalization, which, partly, which is partly obvious, incontrovertible, partly also, I think, mysterious, it has not been examined very closely. So I want to examine that, what is meant by the generalization of, <coughs> of the language of modern political thought. I should also say at the start that I am a historicist, I think I started out with a strong sort of Marxist um, way of looking at uh, intellectual history. Uh, but I still believe that, you know, which is a rather odd and uh, unorthodox belief, I think that Marx was actually one of the principal historicist thinkers, uh, along with thinkers like Hegel, who I think is the uh, start of modern historicism. But ordinarily, people like Diltai, Gadamer, Heidegger, etc., these are people who would be associated with the tradition of historicism. But I believe, rather idiosyncratically, that Marx is part of that historicist tradition. Now, my first point is that modernity <coughs> is a contradictory structure in Marx's sense of the term. Why is that important? Because you can take you know, either a Hegelian view of modernity or you can take what I would, I'll simplify the argument and call it, let's say, a Marxian view of modernity. What do we mean by a Hegelian view? <coughs> a Hegelian view, if you look at Hegel's philosophy of history, you'll find that Hegel divides Western history, which is the serious part of his 
writing in that book. Um, he divides Western history into three uh, periods, the Greek period, the Roman period, and the modern period. How are these periods conceived? The periods are conceived essentially as the structure of experience which is homogeneous for people who live inside that particular historical period. So if you're a Roman living in the Roman period, uh, whether you are uh, you know, from the rich uh, strata of society or poor, or whichever part of Roman world you live in, you would be part of an experience which is a kind of singular, if not homogeneous. Homogeneous is to be unfair to Hegel. Hegel is a highly sophisticated thinker. But uh, it is one kind of singular experience. I think what Marx introduces into this <coughs> is the idea that if it is a structure which is internally hierarchical and uh, internally oppressive, particularly if it's internally hierarchical and inegalitarian, it's impossible for people to have a sufficiently singular experience of that society. So the example that I give to students while teaching in Colombia <coughs> is that if somebody asks me, uh, what is the experience of living in the Upper West Side of New York? I can tell you accurately what is my experience of living in Upper West Side, which is a specific space with a kind of structure of social relationships, etc. But I keep on telling my students, one day I was walking back to, walking to my office and I met a black, uh, fairly young black person who must have been about 25. So he came up to me and he said, uh, he asked for some money, <coughs> which is not an unusual experience, although you live in one of the richest uh, cities in the world. That itself is a problem, that you know, it's true that in a certain sense, New York is the richest city in the world. But that does not mean that everybody in New York is a rich person. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elementary insight, but it's a very powerful insight. So I fumbled in my pocket uh, looking for some money to give him, and he asked me an absolutely stunning question. I've never been asked a question like that, which is very simple, but also completely unsettling. I think because I was fumbling for the money, it was embarrassing for both me and him, so I think to get out of that embarrassment or to do something, he said, sir, have you ever been homeless? And so I was really, really struck by <coughs> that question. And I think that is basically Marx's what Marx introduces into the idea that a society is a unity in a Durkheimian or Hegelian sense. I think the Hegelian and the Durkheimian meaning of the unity of society is very similar. But what Marx introduces into that is a very palpable sense that there's no uniformly singular experience of a society. A society is contradictory. It depends on which part of society, which angle of society you're looking at the society from. And that would determine <coughs> what is true of that society. So it's not that my experience of Upper West Side is wrong and his experience of Upper West Side is right. The trouble is that both our experiences of Upper West Side are right. And we must have a description of a society which conceptually can accommodate you know, the truth of both these experiences of that society. So I take contradictory <coughs> in Marx's thinking to be that. That's why I think you know, there's a very rich debate between the Hegelian side and the Marxian side on this question. But anyway, my main point is that modernity is a contradictory structure. And what does that mean? it offers a choice between two different ways of looking at modernity. One is to think that modernity is a process which starts in Western Europe, <coughs> spreads through colonialism and other influences to the rest of the world, and the meaning of the modernization process is that the more time passes, you know, the rest of the world would actually become similar to the experience of modernity in the West, which is what I would call the story of replication, which is a very, very persuasive story, it's a very powerful story. I think academically, when I was young, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, that was the dominant story, that the rest of the world, if you give it more time, it would actually become like Western Europe. It's a logic of replication. <coughs> but everybody was not convinced by that. For instance, if you take a Bengali writer, who in spite of some of his problems is one of my great favorites, Bonkim Chatterjee, 
I think what I find very powerful and interesting about Wong Kim is that he is the first author to notice that there is a kind of process in modernity, colonial modernity, which you can call a process of replication. But it's a degraded replication for Wong Kim. Uh, you have industrialization in the West, but you have a degraded form of in industrialization in the colony. So there is a replication-like process for Bunkim, or take Dada by Noroji, poverty and un-British rule in India. Bunkim's argument is more of a cultural argument. Dada by Noroji's argument is a more economic argument. But the argument is essentially the same. <coughs> Very early in the history of the unfolding of colonial modernity, they questioned the idea of this kind of simple replication. They believe that what happened through colonial modernity is not a replication of modernity in the West, but a very different kind of process which happens in the colonies. For instance, one, an economic version of that process is given a good name because I think it captures that point. Think of Andre Gunderfrank's thesis that what happens in the non-Western world is a development of underdevelopment. Right? So it's not a development of development, it's a development of underdevelopment. <coughs> so it's in that sense that modernity is a contradictory process. If that is true, then of course it follows from that, that uh, modernity would be experienced very differently. Modernity is not a uniform experience. It's a kind of non-equivalent experience on, on the two poles of modernity. So colonial modernity is not a replication. The colonial modernity is the unfolding of a very different kind of logic which needs to be theorized. And my first point, the reason why I use the term transversal movement is that we think about our modernity through the language that we have taken from uh, the language of Western modernity, because the language of social science is in that sense a common language. But my point is that since the historical world is a very differently constituted historical world, with the languages pulled across, the boundary between one historical world and another, you know, then it produces certain types of uh, changes in the language itself. The language, first of all, <coughs> the structure of argumentation has to be changed because are, you are arguing about a history, which is a different, differently constituted history. And sometimes what is very interesting is that the concepts which we use, they change their valence, they change their, uh, you know, they change their epistemic properties in our own hands. When we, we take a term like the state, and uh, which has a very strong Weberian understanding of the meaning of the term, condensed into it, into the term state, I take that term and try to understand the Indian bureaucracy, then <coughs> the content of the term state actually starts changing in my hands when I try to apply it to Indian society, I have to constantly modify it. So this kind of thing is what I call a transversal movement in political theory. Because political theory is my discipline, I can actually make that point more confidently. But my feeling is that this is the logic that we can find in all historical social sciences. I'm saying historical because economics, for instance, is a science which it has a slightly different character. But even there, I think it would be interesting to raise this question, at least as a hypothesis. <coughs> Let me now turn to an argument which should be familiar to all of you who, are, who know Indian political thinking. There's a very powerful argument made by people for whom I have great regard. Um, I'll give you two examples. Professor Bhiko Parikh, who is a student of Western political thought, he had a paper which was called The Poverty of Indian Political Thought. Parikh's concerns are predominantly with <coughs> academic political theory. And his argument is that in academic political theory, Indians have not contributed very original ideas. <coughs> I'm more concerned with the work of one of my very close friends, uh, Partho Chatterjee, whose book makes a more, I think, much larger argument because Partho's argument is not about people like us who are academic political theorists, <coughs> but about some of the great thinkers of modern political life in India. People like Gandhi, his, his book had three examples, Bunkim Chatterjee, Gandhi, and Nehru. Uh, 
So these are the kind of people about whom Partho is thinking. And Partho's argument is that that thinking is also unoriginal in some ways and derivative, except for Gandhi. You know, I, I think Partho's book is an amazingly important book for many different reasons. <coughs> Particularly the reason which I thought was very important, which Bartho himself <coughs> did not always emphasize, uh, but I think that is the crucial intervention of the book, is something which is related to uh, the intervention by uh, Edward Said, Orientalism. Because what Bartho is saying, if you read his book carefully, is that, of course, what Said says about Orientalism is true, that there is a body of thought with that structure, with those uh, intellectual epistemic properties which develop in the West in that particular time. And it has many deficiencies. But Parthu's point is startling. He says that, you know, it's not merely Europeans who think about the Orient like that. Actually, Indian nationalists who are totally opposed to the political domination of the West in India, they also think like that. So therefore, anti-colonialism is merely political anti-colonialism over a very narrow band. And political anti-colonialism can actually go very easily with a certain kind of epistemic reliance on <coughs> Western thought. So I think that's a very profound um, intervention in thinking about <coughs> the originality of Indian political thought. I have actually started deviating from that a little bit um, uh, more recently. <coughs> I would like to argue that through the complex and messy thinking around the time of independence partition, and let's say 30 years before that, um, Indian political thinkers produced a lot of innovative suggestions, but we ignored them in two different ways. One is that we academics, because we are actually trapped into uh, languages and uh, criterion conventions of Western political thought, we tend to ignore them and treat them as uh, derivative, more derivative than they really are. <coughs> and the other interesting thing is that they themselves, the people who produce these innovative ideas, they underestimate their own originality. So let me make that point more clearly. I'll, I can make that point regarding many different questions, but let me take the question of this state because there is no larger question than the question of the state in political theory. <coughs> so in a sense, what I'm suggesting is that my argument would stand or fall depending on whether what I'm saying about Indian thinking about the question of the nation and the state is plausible or not. <coughs> so let me give you a kind of potted history of the theorization of the nation state. The nation state is very different from the pre-modern states, right? Pre-modern states are usually empire states, the larger one, and the nation state is very different from the pre-modern state. The features of the pre-modern and modern states are generally well known. <coughs> the modern state has static boundaries, more or less, and it's because of that the relationship between the rulers or the state, if you don't want to use the rulers, the state and the people is a stable relation. And so therefore the relationship, the question, what should be the relation between the people and the state? Should the people own the state? Should the people be subjected to the state? This kind of question is not a question that is reasonable to ask about an empire state, because the empire state actually expands and contracts, you know, like a concertina. That is, it expands very quickly and it contracts very quickly. <coughs> and therefore, the structure of the empire state simply frustrates the asking of a question of this kind about the relation between the people and the state. Now, <coughs> with the rise of colonial modernity and uh, as the question of the state became clear, to Indian thinkers. In fact, they realized that uh, in the unfolding of modernity, both during the colonial period and the post-colonial period, the question of the nation and the state would become crucial. They started thinking about it. And I'm going to suggest that Indian political thought from the middle of the 19th century to today, literally today, 
um, I'm thinking of the election because I think in some ways, some of the very general and abstract questions that I'm dealing with in this lecture, I think they are actually at play in <coughs> the election that is taking place from today. So my suggestion is that Indian political thought actually got split down the middle on this question. Uh, you know, how do we define the people? How do we define the state? And what is the relation between the state and the people? And uh, another way of raising that question would be to ask it in the following way, which is a more technical way. But I think <coughs> if you do it this way, it helps us think through this question more clearly. This is the relation between, I'll put it more technically, pre-existing and pre-affective sociological communities and the constructed political community. The question is, uh, what should be the relation between sociological communities like the religious community, caste as a sociological community, my linguistic group as a sociological community, which are pre-existing in the sense that these are communities which exist before the coming of the modern state. If you want, we can get into details of the discussion about the coming of the modern state itself, because I have slightly unorthodox positions on, on that the coming of the modern state. But in any case, once the modern state is upon us, this becomes a crucial question. Should the political community, the people who are members of the state, be coexistent with a pre-existing, pre-affective sociological community? Pre, I'm calling it pre-affective in the sense that modernity or the techniques of the state or anything does not have to produce the affect which infuses the religious community. You know, the solidarity that Hindus feel for each other, or the solidarity that the Tamils feel for each other, or the solidarity, as Ambedkar would uh, never tire of saying, the solidarity that the caste members feel for each other, right? These are in that sense, that's why I'm using the term, these are pre-affective sociological communities. The affect is already there. The affect doesn't have to be constructed. What should be the relation between the political and the sociological community? I think European, Indian political thought splits down the middle into two trajectories, two antagonistic trajectories, very surprisingly. One is the trajectory that I would call the Euro-normal trajectory. I've used the term Euro-normal in a different paper. I wrote a paper a long time back, I think in 2005. It came out in the European Journal of Sociology, <coughs> where I used the term Euro-normal to indicate a form of thinking you know, which believes that what has happened in Europe for the first time has some kind of a determining precedental you know, normative quality. Right? And so I said in that paper that you know, just as the needle of the compass turns on its own if you do not do anything you know, to the north, your normal thinking essentially thinks like that, that if you do not make an effort, then whenever you use a concept, it actually turns to the, you know, to the north of our thinking, which is the Euro-normal Euro position. And a second trajectory, which I would call, I still, I'm still looking for words, uh, a trajectory which I would call a Euro-deviant trajectory, something which deviates from Europe. <coughs> and surprisingly, I would argue that the people who represent the Euro-normal trajectory are people like Islamic thinkers, like uh, not really Sayyid Ahmed Khan, because Sayyid Ahmed Khan is very early, and uh, there are all kinds of complex things going on in his thinking, but if you think of Iqbal, Jinnah, particularly people who support the creation of Pakistan, and, the, and also Hindu nationalists, who are actually simply mirror images of that kind of thinking, who believe simply, the point that I'm making is very simple, who believe simply that the pre-affective and the pre-existing, already available um, sense of community that you have among the Muslims and Hindus, those should simply be remarked or reinscribed as the affect of the, of the nation or affect of the people. <coughs> so that should be the people. So the people should be Hindu or the people should be Muslim or something like that. So they are exactly identical in their thinking in that respect. And the euro devian trajectory, I think, begins with, again, the Bengali thinker I admire very much, <coughs> who is conservative, who is Hindu, 
But in spite of that, I think he has a remarkable way of understanding the structure of modernity. His name is Bhudev Mukhopadhyay. I wrote a paper a long Bhudev Mukhopadhyay. Uh, I wrote a paper a long time back uh, called Reversal of Orientalism, which is an account of Bhudev Mukhopadhyay's thinking. And let me make a point very briefly. You know, Bhudev Mukhopadhyay suggests in his thinking that there can be two ways in which you can think about the political community. One is the principle of blood, in a certain sense. Uh, blood or some kind of ascriptive belonging. That is, we are Hindus or we are uh, Bengalis or, you know, be, we belong to a particular caste. He believes that the other principle, for which he doesn't use a name, the other principle is the principle of neighborliness. That is, people that we live with in, in our everyday world. You know, people whom, if you are a believer, you would say, God has placed as my next door neighbor. If you do not believe in God, then you say that history has placed as my next door neighbor. And it is with these people who are our neighbors that we really enjoy an intense and real bond of sociality. You know, so my real bond of sociality is, as a Hindu living in Bengal is not with somebody who is a Hindu living in Lahore. That is an imaginary, it is an imaginary bond. But it's also partly an illusory bond, right? Whereas the Muslim or the Christian who live on two sides of my apartment in Kolkata, with them I have a bond, I have a sociality, which is not a false sociality, it's actually real sociality, the sociality of, of neighborliness. <coughs> anyway, let me turn now quickly to uh, what I would call a Hegelian problem. <coughs> the Hegel problem, I'm, I call it a Hegelian problem here in a slightly technical sense. Um, if this had been a problem which was already there in Hegel, I would have called it a Hegel problem. Since it is not directly there in Hegel, but I believe that if you follow Hegel and think um, like Hegel, then you can de derive this problem on your own. So that's why I call it not a Hegel problem, but a Hegelian problem. So what is a Hegelian problem? The problem in Hegel is, if you look at much of the argument in the philosophy of right, <coughs> famously, Hegel says that in the modern world, there are three types of sociabilities, right? Or three types of sociality. The first is the sociability of the family. The second is the social, sociability of what Hegel calls civil society. Uh, but remember, Hegel's German uh, phrase is Burgerliche Gesellschaft. So we would actually call it bourgeois society. <coughs> bourgeois society, it's a Burgerliche Gesellschaft. But in English, we translate that into uh, civil society. And the third form of soci sociability or sociality is the universal sociality of the state, right? So, I don't have the time to get into the details of the Hegelian argument, but I'll take two crucial parts of the Hegelian argument, so I need to explain that very quickly to you. <coughs> what is Hegel's problem? Hegel's problem is that inside the family, of course, we have a pre-given, unconditional love or affection for other members of the family. So the kind of solidarity that we feel for our siblings, for our parents, for our children, right? That's a kind of very intense and pre-given form of solidarity. But that solidarity cannot be transferred, you know, to more general, so on larger scales, for instance, to the society of the state or something like that. And there's a peculiar problem which bothers Hegel, and I think in this Hegel is very perceptive about the rise of capitalism. If you look at <coughs> Hegel's section on the civil society, the Burgerliche Gesellschaft section, you will find that Hegel's argument is, he is looking, remember that the phrase that he uses, almost as a kind of subtitle of that entire section, is the system of needs, and system of needs and a system of interdependence, right? So it's a recapitulation of the Adam Smith argument that it's good that for supplying our needs, we don't have to depend on the charity of the butcher and the baker. We depend on their self-interest. 
right? But that is actually the character of the capitalist economy. We have to depend on other people and their self-interest for serving our need. But that creates a problem, which I think Hegel sees very clearly. This is why I think Hegel is such an important thinker about modernity. <coughs> Hegel thinks that the system of interdependence produces only interdependence and no solidarity. On the contrary, apart from producing no solidarity, what the capitalist economy does is that it organizes people more and more tightly into larger and larger conglomerates of classes, right? So suppose, um, you know, individual, there's an, there are 50 individual workers in a particular plant, right? They would uh, join together and form a trade union, right? There are 50 other industries in the same city. So they would also form their trade unions, and then they would form a trade union of their trade union in that city. And they would form a trade union of cities into a trade union of that entire society. So what is the logic of this? The logic of this is that the class, which has a particularistic interest, right, it gets more and more and more intensely organized. And the boundary of its relationship with other classes is constantly inflamed to the extent these classes are more well organized. It becomes very difficult to produce any principle of universality which mediates between these classes. So the rise of classes in capitalist society you know, produces particularities, which is a big problem because earlier particularities carried by individuals is not a such, such a big problem. But particularities which become generalized more and more, and these communities become larger, more powerful, and more unaccommodating in their demands against other communities in the society. And because of interactive relationships, remember that the, just as the workers are organizing, the capitalists are organizing, middle class people are organizing, the peasantry are organizing. So it's an interactive process. It's not a process in which one can become more coalesced, leaving the others uncoalesced. In fact, it is something which produces coalescence of larger entities all around. So what does it do? It produces interdependence among the members of each of these classes, but it simply does not produce any solidarity across them. But the state, in order to exist, needs solidarity, needs a universal principle. So Hegel puts it very sharply by saying that a society which is based on a capitalist economy cannot produce a cement of society on its own. And he believes that, that to produce that and to retain that, you need an institution which is separate from the economic institutions of capitalism, which has a different principle, which works in a different way, and that institution is the state, because the state's principle is a universal principle. And every society, even though it is based on a capitalist economy, requires a universal principle like that. So that is what I call the Hegel problem. It's a Hegelian problem for us, because in our case, the difficulty for producing that universal principle doesn't come from the effectiveness of the capitalist economy, it actually comes from the effectiveness of other types of social solidarities which exist before, like caste, religion, lang linguistically based, cultural communities, etc. So the problem that Hegel thinks is at the heart of the modern state is also our problem, but it's not our problem in the sense that it's not, our problem is not caused by the same historical process. For Hegel, the historical process is the rise of capitalism. For us, the historical process, the sociological process, has a different character. <coughs> so this is the Hegelian problem. I'll now turn to only one side of the two trajectories. I told you that in India, political thinkers actually were split down the middle between a Euro-normal and Euro-deviant um, trajectory. So I think I'll tell you very briefly now in a few minutes what the Eurodeviant trajectory is and then make a few remarks at the end about why I think this is valuable and why we persistently neglect and uh, in some cases really disvalue this uh, kind of thinking in our own intellectual tradition. 
So as I told you before, I see a kind of lineage of this kind of thinking from Budev Mukhopadhyay in Bengal. Uh, of course, I'm uh, a Bengali and therefore chauvinistic by definition. So I start with the Bengali thinker, Budev, but I also think that he's one of the first to make this argument. <coughs> so that trajectory runs through Budev, Gandhi, Tagore, Nehru. But the change, uh, as the change hands, Budev argument is not exactly the same as Gandhi's. Gandhi's is obviously not exactly the same as Tagore's, and their argument is not the same with Nehru. But the central part, which is the same, which Tagore articulates, through a phrase which I have taken from him for my title. So let me talk about Tagore. <coughs> when Tagore gave the three famous lectures which are put together as the book, <coughs> Nationalism, the first part is about nationalism in the West, the third part is nationalism in Japan, and the uh, second is nationalism in Japan, and the third is nationalism in India. In the Japanese section, he says, that we all understand what the European nation state is, right? But we are people who come from the world of the no nation. This is the phrase that he uses in his uh, lecture directly. We come from a world which is the world of the no nation. So what does he say? He's actually in a more literary, imprecise language, he's basically saying, which is true during his time, that the world which is free, the European world, they have a stable form of the state, which is the form of a single people, united by the same language, same religion, most of the time, uh, same historical memory, and things like that. And that is their state. So the state nation are together in a certain sense, right? They're uniform. He's telling the Japanese, he's imploring the Japanese, uh, he's saying that your country is not like that yet. But don't take that road. Actually, I gave a lecture in Japan uh, four or five years back, which was, I think, the anniversary of Tagore's lecture in Japan. And most of the people who responded to my lecture <coughs> in Tokyo, they said that, you know, we are all sorry that we did not take Tagore's uh, advice. Because when Tagore went to Japan, he was received by 3,000 people. And when he left, he was actually accompanied by two people who came to see him off at the, uh, at the port. And the main reason for that was his uh, warning to the Japanese not to take the path of the nation state. <coughs> so I think what Tagore is saying is that the non-European world is historically different from the European, and therefore it needs an ideal of the state which is not the ideal of the nation state. So that is something which we call the non-nation uh, world. So I call it the non-nation state. Let me give you an example from more recent Indian history to show why <coughs> this is still important. Think of the Constituent Assembly in India. If you read the Constituent Assembly, read the debates, you will find that on the question of what kind of state should India have, you have a clear difference between two schools, two sides. And the sides are very paradoxically placed. On the one side, you have people who see themselves as traditionalists, you know, who are partly Hindu nationalists. They're certainly tradition, traditionalists. They dress in the traditional way. They uh, often speak in, in Hindi. But they are the people who are making the following argument, <coughs> that we are going to be an independent state now. Right, I'm holding off the term nation state. We are going to become an independent state now. Let us look around the world and see what successful states are. Where can you find successful states? Only in Europe. <coughs> and what are the common features of the successful states in Europe? These are the features of the nation state. The uniform nation, you know, sitting behind the state, which actually provides both the affect and the power of the state. So if we want to become a successful state, we must become a state of that kind. So we must become a nation state in the European sense of the term, the European model. <coughs> On the other side, you have people who are very westernized in some sense. Think of Ambedkar and Nehru as two examples. You know, Nehru is obviously westernized in some ways. Ambedkar never, is never photographed 
except in the three-piece suit and with the constitution under his arm. So they're very westernized in a certain sense. But look at the political solution they're suggesting for India. They are saying that India is a, is a complex, extremely diverse society. This is the Hegelian problem. <coughs> they recognize that problem as being central. And if you want to impose on this society the constitutional structure of the nation state, this society would explode. You must have a constitutional form which is adjusted to the social diversity of this society. And we must invent that constitutional form. I think my conclusion is that uh, in, in a paper that I wrote recently, instead of using India and Pakistan, or using the names of the different people, I've simply, in order to keep the argument clear, I've called this model one and model two of states. Model one is the model of the European nation state. And my argument is that these people are trying to produce a form of a state, which is model two, which is radically, fundamentally different from <coughs> the structure of the European nation state. But the people who are demanding model one are the traditionalists, and people who are demanding model two are actually westernized in some respects, which is the odd thing about, <coughs> about the debate. And also the, the implication for that in our present situation is that people who are Hindu nationalists, they constantly campaign, they constantly argue that other people who are not like them, they are under the influence of European thinking. But if you look at the absolutely fundamental question of, of political theory, the nature of the state and the structure of the state, their thinking is the most European uh, thinking of all. Now, so I want to conclude by arguing several things. <coughs> First, I think the Indian thinkers, through a long tradition of prior thinking on these questions philosophically, and in the actual work in the Constituent Assembly, produce a form of a state which is substantially different from the European nation state, which is actually model two. I believe that as the world becomes decolonized, more and more societies actually demand a model two kind of state. Saudi Arabia, to take an example from the Middle East, can work with a model one state, but Iraq cannot work with a model one state. And my argument would be that many, many uh, societies, probably a majority of societies in the modern world are in need of a model two state rather than a model one state. So that is the significance of the form of the state that the Indian thinkers created. <coughs> now, let me make my last point quickly. The Indian thinkers, however, remain trapped in a language of European political theory, which is the language that was created for the development and the justification of the state that I'm calling Model 1. So there's a deep contradiction in the process of their thinking, because they're trying to use a language which is the Model 1 language in the service of a state, which is a kind of Model 2 state. So there is a tension. So it, it does three things. Sometimes it hinders their thinking. Secondly, it overrides their own thinking by discordant language. Sometimes they, and because of that, they are not always very confident because they are speaking in a ventriloquist kind of way from the middle of a language which is of a different kind. And finally, it makes them make false moves because sometimes they are under the pressure of language. Language here is not just a natural language, it's a conceptual language, it's an imaginary. And because of the pressure of that imaginary, sometimes they make false moves, for instance, I think when they declare that there are 15 national languages of India, it's a good example of uh, what I'm, I'm criticizing in their work. And so I think this question of overriding of their action by their own language is something on which we need to do more work. So therefore, my conclusion would be that um, academic political thought in India is uh, more dependent, you know, more derivative uh, than we believe. And political, political thought in India, which is not academic, the political thought of Indian political leaders of the nationalist period, I think they're less derivative than we think. And <coughs> we are now assailed by demands 
for a Europeanization of the state in that sense, when European themselves are actually looking at a kind of model too. And so basically what I'm arguing is that we should learn to honor you know, what is really innovative in our tradition. And in order to do that, we must also emancipate ourselves in a sense from the sort of general influence of the language of modern political thought. Thank you. Could you speak more into your mic here? You know, I would divide your question into two parts because I think uh, both parts are very interesting. <coughs> um, you know, when I think about political theory, I sometimes suspect that I actually think more about the language than about the substance. Because I'm really, really fascinated by the work of language because in a sense, um, it's very rarely that you know human beings, whatever kind of language using human beings we are, uh, literary people use language, philosophers use language, analysts use language, uh, political publicists use language. But I think in some cases it's better to say, it's not a new idea, I think modern the theories of language, structuralists and others, they emphasize this, that uh, language controls us rather than we control the language. Um, so this is something that I think about constantly. And I'm impressed by both sides, you know, the operation of language in our thinking. Uh, much of my work recently has been on language and thinking. Uh, how do we think? And since we cannot think without thinking through language, you know, if language has some kind of independent effectuality, it's very important to try to separate that off and see the consequences, see the effect of that. So <coughs> I believe that on the one side, we cannot do without the language of Western political theory, because one of the interesting things about colonialism is the disruption of language that um, the, uh, I'm partly bringing up something which I'm writing about. There's a very well-known, very distinguished Western political theorist. His name is James Tully, who is a major figure in thinking about John Locke, Foucault, and things like that. James Tully has written a paper recently which is called Deparochalizing Political Theory. And uh, it was published, and I was asked to write a response to that. I wrote a short response. I'm now in the process of writing a long response. So that's why this question is very much <coughs> on my mind. So Tali gives the example of, he has been very uh, forceful in the cause of the Inuit people in, uh, in Canada. And so he says that when a Western political theorist has to talk to somebody coming from a different tradition, uh, you have to respect their language and things like that. I said in my response to Tully that, you know, I'm also subject to the history of colonialism. My society has been affected by the history of colonialism as powerfully as the Inuit society in, in Canada, but in very different ways. Because the Inuits, by rejecting modernity, in a certain sense, retained the integral quality of their language, you know, conceptual language. Their, their social imaginary in a certain sense. They did not allow that to be taken apart and fragmented by influences of colonialism. In our case, it's not like that. In our case, we lost our language completely. Think of how many people know Sanskrit, right? And the point is that even if everybody amongst us knew Sanskrit absolutely fluently, 
I know Sanskrit reasonably well. I do not think if we go back to, let's say, the Arthashastra or the Manusmriti, or uh, there's a very big uh, Dharma Shastra text which is called the Veera Mitrodaya, which was written during uh, Jahangir's time. I don't think that would actually give us a vocabulary or a language which would help us understand our modern politics, right? So where do we get the language from? So my point is that on the one side, we must do something to the language that we derive from the West, right? But it cannot work unless we do something to that language, right? <coughs> the simple example would be that you take the term state, which is completely filled in its semantic content with a Weberian definition. At the moment you go out to see the state functioning in Sonipat, you will find that the state simply does not function in anything like the Weberian way. So I cannot abandon the term state. I cannot use the term state. So what we need to do is exactly what I'm saying and what I think Indian political thinkers did. They used the term, but they modified the semantic content of the term. Sometimes they did it naively, sometimes they did it unselfconsciously. But our task as academic political theorists is to understand what they did, which they did not understand themselves sometimes, right? But uh, there's nothing wrong in that. For instance, Steiermacher said that somebody who, uh, who is a literary critic must understand the author better than he did himself. I think the uh, idea that he had in mind was something like this, that I should be able to look at Nehru's work or Gandhi's work and then say that, you know, this is, let me give you an example. <coughs> they truly believed on the one side that they were trying to do something which is different from the Western nation state. Right? So they constantly um, say to themselves that we are doing something which is exceptional, you know, which, is, which is not the norm. We should also think about that point more closely. B because as I said that I'm a historicist, so I try to understand things historically. I think at that point, if you think of Nehru in 1947, or not just Nehru, the people who were part of the Constituent Assembly in 1947, in a sense, what they were trying to do was exceptional because all the free states were essentially European states and the states which fill the United Nations today from the decolonized world, they were simply not free states, right? So India was an exception in the sense that if in 1947 you asked the question, there were let's say 15 or 20 great Western states and India was the only state which was trying to produce this non-nation state kind of model. So I think what we need to do is to understand the language in two senses. We, we should understand the language that they got from Europe and try to understand the logic and the structure of that language. We must try to understand what they are doing with that language, you know, which is the Wittgensteinian <laughs> point, that uh, meaning of the language actually lies in its use. So the use is deflecting the meaning of the language quite substantially. We should try to understand the use and therefore de deflection of the language and try to theorize that. And then we should also understand that they are constantly apologetic, they are constantly sort of genuflecting in a certain sense to the dominant Western language. And while reading them, we should tell them that, you know, you cannot tell them directly, but you sh we have to tell them that, you know, this is something that you should not have done. Right? Because you have a right to modify constitutional principles according to your own needs. The other side of the language question is, I think, uh, you know, about the nation state. I sometimes ask myself, uh, if they saw it so clearly that the structure of the European nation state would not fit India. Because I think if you look at the controversy about Pakistan, right, all their arguments against Pakistan, is essentially an argument that the model one kind of state would not work in a country like India, right? We must actually create a model too. So that's what they're trying to do. At the same time, I think I sometimes ask myself that why didn't, why did, were they so intent on continuing with the term nation? I think they 
were intent on that for a good reason, because they realized that interdependence is not enough, right? So the state should not be just a convenience. The state must, must be supported by a certain kind of affect. I think it's a great question, and it's a question about which we should think more closely, because there's some European political theorists today who would say that, you know, do not look for an affect to stand behind the state. Think of the state simply as a constitutional convenience. Right? Don't look for an affect. I think because they were inheritors of the national movement, they wanted an affect, but they wanted a genuine affect, you know, which is not just a translation of the affect of the religious community or the affect of, the, of caste or affect of the regional culture. Right? So these are the ways in which you know, the question of language becomes central. And so when I tried to write it up, in fact, what I presented to you is a very, very sort of squashed form of a larger argument. In Jamia, I had time because I had five lectures. So I elaborated on this by giving examples. But uh, when I write it up, if I write it up as a book, I would spend quite a lot of time on the question of language. Language is something which actually fascinates me uh, in thinking about this, especially because, you know, how do you think about thinking? without thinking about language. Again, I think very good question. <coughs> you know, you said balancing individual and collective rights, individual and group rights. I would add only one uh, idea to that, <coughs> which is the historicist idea. Historicist in the sense that if you look at the designing of the Constitution, you will see that in many, many cases, which are cases of group rights, those are essentially temporarily conditioned. You know, even about uh, reservations, the original constitution sometimes said for 10 years or 15 years, extendable later on. They, le they left it indefinitely extendable, right? But they were extended so many times that we have simply forgotten the initial conditionality, the temporal conditionality of it. So balancing meaning, they were not saying that individual and group rights should be balanced. They were saying individual and group rights should be balanced now at that particular point, but they expected the society to change sufficiently so that after some time, you know, that balancing has to be reworked, right? And in some cases, their expectations were actually put into the directive principles like uniform civil code. So they are not saying that the uniform civil code is wrong. 
They are simply saying that at this particular moment, we do not want to push for a universal civil code. And I have a disagreement with some of my friends, you know, who want to make a philosophical argument of that sort of thing. I do not think their arguments are philosophical arguments. I think their arguments are historical arguments. They are not saying that that is in principle wrong. They were saying that you know, at that particular moment, we think it would be wrong to do that. Right? So that's the first point. And remember <coughs> that that itself is an illustration of what I'm saying. If you look at Ambedkar, I think Ambedkar is admired for many different reasons. But I think Ambedkar ought to be admired for something else, which is not even mentioned. Today, <coughs> If you look at the huge Western literature about group rights, individual and group rights, you will find that there's a very large academic literature. Look for an academic literature on individual and group rights in 1946, right? There's no academic literature of individual and group rights anywhere in the world. So what are these people doing? They are themselves educated in the West. Ambedkar educated in Columbia, my university. <coughs> <laughs> also at the LSE, all these people are educated in the West. They are coming back and they are improvising, modifying. In another paper, I called it a kind of lateral elaboration. That is when you elaborate laterally across a historical boundary or into a different universe. You have to add things which were not there before. So I think the Indian Constitution is an amazing document, which is for the first time saying that group rights would not actually totally undermine a constitution which is based on individual rights, right? The kind of thing which has become now almost academic orthodoxy, right, was inconceivable at that time, right? And I think it's the task of political theorists, you know, academic political theorists, to notice this and to theorize this, right? On the question of uh, deviation, <coughs> again, you know, my thinking is historicist, so what I'm saying is that in 1946, they, could be, they should have been forgiven for thinking that what they are doing is a deviation. Because they could look at all the other great constitutions of the world. No constitution did this. So it was a deviation. It was an exception to the rule. But when the world changed, and the world became decolonized, in 46, the world was not decolonized. This was the first initial step of decolonization, which was very awkward, right? Think of Churchill, who believed that it can be reversed, right? So we should not actually take for granted the world in which we live, where we accept a kind of finality of decolonization. But they're living in a world where decolonization itself is a kind of, almost a hypothesis, is being tried out. Now, in that world, they were right, they were justified in saying that this is an exception. But gradually, I think what happens is that it becomes clearer, as Barthus says in one of his books, where I think the politics of the governed has an interesting title. I think it says politics of nearly everywhere, something, uh, something like that. that, which is something that I, I agree with, that the more the world evolved through the process of decolonization, it became quite clear that Europe was the exception and not the rule. But the thing is that we do not have the academic confidence, intellectual confidence, to announce that, right? And decoloniality is a literature which I partly like, partly dislike, in the sense that I think it's a literature which is full of rhetoric, uh, which is good, for instance, provincializing Europe. Of course, Europe should be provincialized. But it cannot be provincialized simply by a declaration that it should be provincialized. What does provincialization mean? I think provincialization would mean that if we make theoretical advances or theoretical moves in the study of the non-European world, which are sufficiently different from the moves of conventional Western political theory, and that becomes enlarged, that would actually alter the balance. Right? You cannot alter the balance by declaration. You have to alter the balance by you know, real theoretical work. So that's why I totally agree with the with what decolonial theory wants. But I don't think decolonial theory actually gives attention to the real theoretical tasks there. I, I wish that you know, they would do that more. Because otherwise it becomes essentially a literature of condemnation of colonialism, which is fine. But I think now, today, we do not need condemnation of colonialism in political practice.
I think what we need to do is to really provincialize European thought by developing you know, other forms of thinking. And one very obvious part of doing that would be to recognize the uh, you know, to recognize original thinking or innovative thinking where it exists. And when I look at my discipline of political theory in India, I think we simply do not recognize that. Uh, look at the way we do our political practice. You know, student, uh, we train students in a way where in my time people would have actually tried to memorize Marx. Uh, today they would memorize probably Foucault or Derrida or something like that. And you know, intellectual quality is represented by you know, how faithfully, how accurately we can show that I have understood Derrida or Foucault. You know, that's not my thinking, right? And so my point is that until we understand that point and recognize what is there, which is really originally in our own tradition, I don't think however much we rhetorically you know, celebrate decoloniality or post-colonial thinking, I don't think we, this is also partly my complaint against you know, the literature, um, the literary literature which came out of sight, right? Because I don't think it actually generated, um, you know, profoundly significant philosophical points which are there in Saith. Saith himself, I think, um, the point that I made uh, should be made more generally that, you know, authors do not always understand themselves very well. They said that they might, uh, might have made points which are very significant, but they are not trained in that discipline. So they miss that point. I teach Saith in a whole course, and the first thing that I try to show the students is this, that you know, there are very deep philosophical questions which are involved in Orientalism. But Orientalism is not a philosopher's book. So he doesn't recognize those questions. And to think with Saith, or to take Saith forward, is not to repeat what he has said, right? But to pick up things which are important, where he didn't realize that he had to say something, and to say something about that. So it's a very good question, I think, question or comment, I think, it's a very important concern. Okay. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk, Dr. Kalmiya. And now I'd like to ask Dr. Rajesh Chakravarti, Dean of JGBS, to present a small token of gratitude.